40 auto card cases. Our moderator for the afternoon, Dr. Oberoi, is the current president of the Indian Arthroscopy Society and was honoured with the Bharat Sharamini Award for his contribution in the field of arthroscopy and joint replacement surgery in 2019. He's a pioneer in both lower and upper limb surgery and is currently the director of orthopaedic sports medicine, joint recon and arthroscopy surgery at Atermis Hospital, Gorgon. So some housekeeping rules before I hand you over to Dr. IPS, except for the panel, if you could keep your camera turned off and your mics muted for the duration of the session, that would be great. Any questions that you do have, please use the chat function and we'll allocate some time at the end of the session to get these answers, to get these answered. And for your information, the session is being recorded. Now that's enough from me. Enjoy everyone and I'll hand over to Dr. IPS Oberoi. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, it's an excellent platform today that we have got uh, some stalwarts in regeneration cartilage transplant surgery. Uh, we have Professor Bea Carlson from Switzerland, and uh, he is, as uh, Tom rightly said, a guru of cartilage transplant and regeneration. And I think we would be lucky enough to hear uh, something about the orthologous minced cartilage transplant today from him. Professor Salzman comes from uh, uh, Switzerland, but uh, he has been trained in uh, Freiburg uh, University in Germany and also with uh, work closely with reconstruction with AO Institute in uh, Davos. Uh, has technical collaborations with the Technical University Munich as well as the Basel University. His current area of interest is tissue engineering and chondrocyte stem cell transplant. And I think he has got more than 100 publications which mix makes him a, a crucial leader in uh, development of autocart and as well as in cartilage regeneration all across the world. Joining him is a, a group of esteemed Indian faculty uh, which are working a lot in doctors with uh, reconstruction surgery. Sir, Dr. Shriyash Kajar, he is a sports medicine and joint regeneration surgeon at Kukla Ben uh, Ambani, Mumbai Ambani Hospital in Mumbai. He has trained and worked in US as in UK as well as Australia and is an uh, expert in uh, cartilage uh, reconstruction and has got last series of uh, cartilage work in India. Uh, Dr. Jasmi uh, is uh, from Yashoda Hospital. Uh, he has been educated in uh, TMC Mysore, uh, has advanced fellowship in Germany as well as in Italy and also uh, fellow from Arthur City Association of Canada. His interest is arthroscopy, sports surgery, and cartilage surgery. And Dr. Naveen Kumar. Dr. Naveen is from Bangalore. Uh, he did education from Bijapur as well as Mysore and uh, was a uh, Chandler gold medal specialist with Titanium Hospital in UK. So, if uh, and so wonderful faculty. So, we have Professor Salzman who is going to start the program and give his work and uh, study about uh, Mills Auto. Logos uh, uh, cartilage and uh, some interesting cases at the discussion uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Jaswi, uh, Dr. Naveen Kumar, and Dr. Shiyashka. So let's start with uh, Professor Salzman and uh, hear uh, him about the latest in cartilage transplant, especially related to the minced uh, chondrocyte cultivation and uh, implantation. So, uh, Professor Salzman, uh, welcome, and if you can share your screen and all right. Uh, hi, everybody from my side as well. Again, uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation and uh, introduction. Since all you guys are a little experienced with the minced cartilage, I'm going to do my first couple slides, which are to my consideration still very important very quickly. Um, the, the thing is, when we are um, re in cartilage, we want to have a high tissue quality within the defective region because it is very clear now that is uh, that that is connected to your clinical uh, outcome, which is again connected to your return to sporting uh, ability. And the biologic potential is mostly important for all problematic cartilage lesions, osteochondral lesions, large chondral lesions, which you often see in unstable knee joints or malaligned knee joints and anything at the patellofemoral joint. 
And what I have learned so far in my last 20 years, I would say in cartilage repair surgery, uh, the best option to treat cartilage defects is by uh, using a cartilage. So uh, the best outcome we see um, in cartilage repair when we are using chondrocytes. And if you're looking at the long-term data, and this is getting really interesting in cartilage repair at 5 and 10 and 20 years, everything will works at one and two years, but it is getting interesting starting at three years. Only ACI and uh, in selected cases, osteochondral transplantation is working in the long run. Uh, for that in Europe and in selected countries worldwide, so as US or Australia, but not so much in India, ACI has been the standard of care for problematic and large uh, chondral lesions, but still it is not a perfect procedure. There are some selected studies that, that show in selected patients a superiori superiority over uh, of concurrent uh, procedures. The problem with ACI is that you take out cartilage in the first operation and then you have to proliferate in the lab and the cells are clearly suffering in the lab from that uh, culturing process by meaning of de-differentiation and senescence. So it is a two-step operation and most patients want to have it quickly. It is highly regulated and for that it is very expensive and for that it is not available in every country worldwide and most likely not in India. But the same problem is currently arising in Germany as well as in Switzerland. Most insurance companies don't want to pay for that uh, very expensive ACI procedure anymore. Furthermore, it is a procedure that now is almost 40 years old and uh, we have to progress with what uh, we do. And this is a, a very important topic uh, to uh, cover up cartilage lesions worldwide. And uh, we came up with the idea of minced cartilage. Uh, the procedure as is has been reported, I would say, 60 years ago already and it has uh, progressed so far and we picked it up again, I would say approximately uh, six years ago and followed up very precisely. And I would say the minced cartilage procedure has a very, very high biologic um, potential, which is clearly comparable to the gold standard ACI or to my consideration even stronger. What is the biologic background of um, the minced cartilage procedure is that you cut cartilage. Uh, by a, a sharp device and with the AutoCAD procedure you use a, a sharp shaver device and when you cut cartilage you activate this activate the cartilage, the chondrocytes, and they uh, start to proliferate again. Uh, this is very clearly evident, but at the same time, they do not only proliferate, but they also put down more matrix in response to the trauma that has been happening. And by that biologic background, the idea of the minced cartilage autocard procedure is to fill up the lesion by native um, tissue. And already in 2009, David Frisbee showed in a large animal translational horse model directly comparing to ACI that the minced cartilage procedure is equally doing well when you compare it to ACI by the histologic scores were even slightly better than ACI. And we could show in a multi-center study when you take out cartilage from the defect edge, uh, the lesion gets only slightly bigger but you have location-specific, very healthy, rich uh, cartilage, and you have stable wards at the same time, and you can transplant it right away. So this is uh, how we currently do it, defect debridement, then coming in with a 3.0 shaver soft tissue device, and then take cartilage from the defect edge. You have healthy location-specific cartilage. After that, you have very stable walls, and then you collect that in a graph net device where you can always monitor how much you have. And you could show in our own study uh, from, from Zurich that the uh, uh, chondrocytes stay healthy over four weeks, even in vitro, and they come out of the chips to establish new matrix for filling up the lesion. Furthermore, you're not transplanting naked chondrocytes, but you're transplanting chondrocytes plus some pericellular matrix, which is directly surrounding the chondrocytes and many very important things for chondrogenesis, for chondrogenesis as well as chondrogenic proliferation are happening at the PCM. And uh, the literature now is uh, getting more rich 
uh, on reporting that chondrons are very effective uh, for cartilage transplantation. And then when you mix your gathered chips with ACP, okay. you have a paste-like appearance and uh, the combination of chondrocytes plus PRP is very effective. You have a good proliferation effect. You have a good chondrogenic effect. You can control inflammation at the site of transplantation, but also uh, at the whole joint. And I see in my own collection of patients and that um, they have not much pain. Usually after two days, they don't have any pain anymore since I do most cases arthroscopically assisted. And then uh, they don't want to uh, walk on crutches for six weeks uh, anymore. Furthermore, the bleeding is limited by ACP because ACP has a pro-coagulation aspect. Furthermore, you're... Okay, and um, so you're attracting stem cells from the surrounding synovia and stem cells plus uh, chondrocytes is also very effective. And finally, you have an anti-infective effect. So the rate of infection is going down. But in my last, now I have almost 180 cases, no infection so far, uh, luckily. So this is uh, how I do it uh, after defect debridement, collecting of cartilage, drying out the knee joint, and then uh, you have your special application cannula. This is just for comparison. Usually it is very easy to try at the medial or lateral condyle uh, because you transplant in flexion. Uh, on the right image, it is trochlear. Uh, usually a little, a little more blood uh, is contaminating your cartilage lesion, but if you have some experience still also at the trochlea where where it is uh, suggested to transplant at 20 to 30 degrees of flexion so the fluid is going down it is also easy to put down uh, the chip and then you take a probing hook or something else to divide the chips across uh, the lesion then thrombin fibrin on top and this is what i always do in my uh, procedures when i'm done i perform full uh, flexion extension maneuvers to test for stability or delamination and uh, usually uh, in all cases you see a very good initial stability and if the patients do weight bearing for four to six weeks after that you can be pretty sure that nothing is going to happen uh, to the chips what you also see here uh, that i on purpose sometimes also transplant some hoffer fat tissue because the hoffer is also rich in stem cells and as said before the stem cells are working very well together with the uh, chondrocytes Furthermore, uh, with the autocard procedure using only ACP fibrin, autologous glue, you don't need a membrane. And this is also coming up in the literature that membrane-free chondrocyte transplantation is the best way because the chondrocytes want to be alone. A membrane is not needed anymore. And without a membrane, you can also um, reach uh, problematic locations. For example, lateral tibia plateau. I have done so, some cases as well. And this works also very good with the uh, autocard procedure at the tibia plateau. Furthermore, usually you have a lot of uh, cartilage to transplant and I started to perform multi-location procedures. So this is medial condyle plus two lesions at the trochlea at once. So far, this patient is also uh, doing very well. Just one example for that you don't need a membrane. This is a young volleyball player who has a chronic cartilage lesion at the patella kneecap. This was uh, almost six square centimeters performed the standard autocard procedure no membrane and this is her five months MRI and uh, no pain so far still little effusion but she's on a very good way and very good cartilage reconstitution without a membrane so now coming to uh, some selected cases out of my portfolio this is a rheumatologist who had a acute on chronic cartilage lesion at this medial condyle plus bone marrow um, edema. He was very anxious about the procedure, but at the same time, uh, very, very careful. Here I performed the standard medial condyle procedure, which is now, if you have done some cases, really easy uh, to do. And the patient uh, really wanted to know what is going on. And he performed a three months MRI. And you see also at already at three months, 
that the cartilage reconstitution is very well. Uh, some uh, bonding problems anteriorly, but this is not a problem. So after three months, you often see very good results, while at the same time the bone marrow edema is reducing. So this is a absolutely typical three months MRI. I usually usually suggest not to do uh, MRIs at such such early time points, but this uh, was done by the patient, and so far looking uh, very uh, good. This is a neurologist who came to my clinic who had a traumatic lesion at his medial trochlea, very sporty, active, not too big of the lesion, performed the standard autocard procedure, as you can see here, some contamination of blood in the trochlea, which is normal. And this is a six months, MRI six months, doesn't look very good, but the patient was pain-free. So we just uh, considered to see what's going on, to wait to continue with rehabilitation. And at 12 months, uh, the transplant looked very nice, no effusion, no pain, uh, return to full sporting activity. So uh, with th those two cases, I wanted to show that the maturation processes are different between subjects. Sometimes it requires six, uh, sometimes 12 months, depending uh, on uh, the patient. This is a, a young Spaniard who came to my clinic with a chronic patella instability and this rather chronic osteochondral uh, lesion here. I performed actually a, a purely arthroscopic uh, autocard procedure at the uh, at the patella. The bone looked fine uh, arthroscopically, so I didn't do anything uh, on the subchondral bone. Standard um, autocard procedure at the kneecap doesn't always look too perfect, but if you can reach it, you should try. Then standard MPFL plasty, and six months later I came to my clinic for. Uh, follow-up uh, MRI clinical routine. The uh, kneecap was very stable, no pain, and the transplant also here in maturation, but you see the bone has reconstituted and on T1 imaging, absolutely no bone marrow edema anymore. And so far, the patient is doing very well. So this is a perfect example for minimally invasive one-step combination procedure of cartilage repair at the kneecap plus patella stabilization. Uh, another patient sporting active had a, a direct trauma to his kneecap. He had this uh, flap at his uh, kneecap also here, a fully arthroscopic um, autocard procedure at uh, the kneecap. And I didn't see the patient for a long time. And he came uh, last month to my clinic for clinical and MRI follow-up. And you can see here, on sagittal imaging that uh, very nice reconstitution of the cartilage, absolutely no pain and full return to sporting activity. So I wanted to show with those two cases, if you can reach uh, the patella nicely, you should try to do it arthroscopically because the rehabilitation and, and so far my results are really uh, brilliant. Another case, 45-year-old um, uh, uh, lady, uh, she had a previous microfracturing at a medial condyle, uh, which uh, more or less failed, constant pain. At the same time, we had a various malalignment, so we had address, to address both pathologies. You can see the subchondral bone uh, was not perfect. You see a typical intralesional osteophyte, which we had to reduce. Um, but then uh, there's a little more bleeding, but still we can do, we could do the autocard procedure on top at the same time perform the uh, tibial valgization using a Tomofix plate. And after one year, the patient was very satisfied. He took out the plate, performed the scoping procedure. Uh, the cartilage reconstitution was very nice, mild hypertrophy, but um, absolutely no symptoms. So we just let uh, that be as uh, uh, as it was. So also good for revision uh, cases plus um, malalignment of uh, the joint uh, axis. Also revision case, young lady, a chronic OD lesion at a medial condyle, uh, multiple previous operations, but only 19 years old. So uh, you should give it uh, one shot. This is how it looked like in the distal part. Okay, proximal part, not okay. So we had to revise it, performing a large cancellous bone plasty. And then we performed an autocard procedure on top. This was pretty large, five square centimeters. I was a little uh, scared because, because of stability. I didn't want uh, the whole thing to drop out. Uh, so I took a synovial membrane from the atrotomy, trimmed it down to the effect size and put it on top. And she came to my clinic six months ago, absolutely pain-free, no effusion. You can see here the, I took the cancellous bone plasty from actually the notch anterior of the PCL. This works nicely. 
The bone has reconstituted very nicely, still maturation going on at the convo uh, aspect, but the patient's clinic is great. She returns slowly to jogging. So, so far, also this revision case with synovial membrane um, a success. Also, um, I try to perform my cancerous bone plasty atroscopically assisted. This is a patient who had a old OD lesion at this lateral trochlea, not too big. So I performed the atroscopic cancerous bone plasty and chips on top, no membrane. I saw this patient on last Wednesday in my outpatient clinic. Now 18 minutes after the procedure, no pain, full return to sporting activity. This is just another um, example how this can work plus cancerous bone autocard on top, no membrane. And this is the last case I'm going to present because I operated this guy on Friday chronic ACL uh, instability he was planned for filling up the bone channel channels which were very large on CT imaging for um, second stage revision ACL but just prior to the operation he played soccer again and he had a um, large um, traumatic flake at this medial condyle with many pieces uh, flying around uh, the knee joint. I collected all uh, the pieces. This is how his medial condyle looked like. So we debrided that and took some of uh, the edge and my assistant at the back table is cutting down those large pieces and then we suck those up using a shaver for the autocard procedure. Also, he had a, a chronic uh, medial bucket handle tear, which was very um, hard to treat, but I put that back, sutured it back in, and you see this is very important for protection of the cartilage lesion, which was right on top. So I debrided his bone channels, put cancellous bone in, and the autocard procedure, and now thumbs pressed that I can re revise them with the ACL in approximately four months. Finally, characteristic, uh, char characteristic complications and the complications I see so far in my autocard procedures are very similar to the ACI complications, which is malfusion of the transplant, insufficient regenerative tissue, delamination, and some hypertrophy. What I've seen most uh, frequently was hypertrophy because I've been filling up the lesion to the top. Now I reduce it to fill, up, fill it up to only 80% so it can grow slowly up. And I think I have reduced my uh, number of hypertrophies so far by that. And this by far is my um, most um, uh, frequent complication. So far, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salzman. It was indeed a wonderful eye-opening presentation. Uh, before we go to our interesting cases and uh, discussions further, uh, there are three questions which have just come up, and I think uh, it's right that we can have uh, questions and then we can go to the, the next uh, presenter. Uh, first question essentially is, uh, how do you evaluate the quality of subcontrol bone? You decide when you do an autocart or when you do add-on uh, so uh, usually the assessment of the subchondral bone is happening prior to surgery on MRI. If I see large cystic lesions, you have to fill it up. If you see old OD lesions or completely osteochondral flakes, you have to fill it up. Um, if you have just some bone marrow edema going on, you usually, usually leave it untouched because the cartilage is going to do it. But um, I, I look at it at the same time intraoperatively, and sometimes you have to fill it up, sometimes not. But it is very important to have a solid base for your overlying uh, cartilage uh, procedure. Microfracturing and uh, integrate, I don't do anymore because... Um, the, the success of your autocard and anything on top is is, is dropping. So, okay, uh, that's good. Uh, in cases where you showed where there was a large defect, it was essentially a revision case. So, in such cases with a large defect, you sometimes find that whenever you are uh, removing the cartilage, you actually need more cartilage than what you are able to get from the edges of the lesion. Yeah. So, in that case, would you go for an intracondylar notch and maybe take it some? graph from there how do you do that so um uh, usually um if if i if i uh, see there's a very large defect um i um take some good looking uh, cartilage from the defect itself actually just to have more to transplant and we have sent many cases of that to the lab 
and the cartilage quality, if it's macroscopically well looking, uh, is usually fine. And then I'm a little more aggressive at the edge. So I take a little more. So if I have six square centimeters, I don't have the problem to go up to 6.4 because I don't want to, I want to try to avoid to go to other locations to have, I don't like non bait bearing cartilage from the notch or from the uh, proximal trochlea but if I have not enough sometimes I take it but usually you get enough and but what, what I also do now currently I just fill it up to 50 60 percent and usually then you have more than enough cartilage without other donor side mobility or non bed bearing cartilage, which is with regard to quality of the cartilage less than from the bed bearing defect. Great. And the last question before we move on, Professor uh, Salzman, uh, you add PRP or ACP in almost all your cases. Would you, in some cases, add a bone marrow aspirate, something like a BMAT? So uh, I have not done that so far. Actually, it is uh, not usually allowed in Switzerland as well in Germany because it is a non-homologous use. Um, basically, I think it's not too bad of an idea, but the I, I think the biologic potential of chondrocytes that are that are repairing a chondral defect plus PRP, the biologic potential is so strong, you don't need much more. And as I said in my presentation, it is now evident that the PRP is attracting actually stem cells coming from the synovia, uh, which is another aspect with regard to stem cells, if you want to have stem cells in your defect. And furthermore, I on purpose sometimes transplant some Hoffer fat tissue. Mm -hmm. So to my consideration, actually, I don't think you need BMAC on top of what you're doing there. And I have the fear of that your BMAC is going to reduce some bone where you do not want to have it. So I avoid it. Um, maybe it is an interesting approach, but we have to see for the results. Okay. Uh, thank you, I think. And we will have uh, more questions later on. I think Dr. Tejasvi has one question. Uh, Dr. Tejasvi, if you can ask the question. Yeah, uh, Professor Salzman, uh, very nice presentation. Um, uh, what we understand is we are uh, uh, we are dependent on the chondrocytes and the other uh, growth potential of the PRPs for the cartilage to be regenerated. Is it not a good idea uh, to do microfracture before this procedure to gain access to the subchondral uh, uh, cells? Yeah. So um, I don't think so. So um, f first of all, um, if you if you have a healthy subchondral bone, you should leave it healthy. Why should you violate it? So the reconstitution is always very bad, as you see in the isolated microfracturing cases where you have a revision rate of almost 30 percent. So if you have a healthy subchondral bone, you should actually leave it. Furthermore, you're violating it to attract stem cells from the subchondral bone. But as many reports before have reported, the the fraction of stem cells coming from the subchondral bone is so, so, so low. So usually what you are attracting is only uh, blood. And if you have blood within your defect, um, blood is usually uh, turning into bone. And then you have bone in your defect, and this is causing pain. This is causing revision cases. So um, I really would not suggest to do it. I have done some cases just like that, and they are uh, worse than uh, without microfracturing. So... Um, you will get the stem cells from somewhere else uh, if you really want to have them there. And if you have a healthy subchondral bone, I would really suggest to leave it just like that. Yeah, I think that answers uh, Dr. Jasmine's question. Uh, it was an interesting presentation, and I think we'll have some more questions as we go by. Uh, let's have uh, uh, our Indian faculty joining in. Uh, so, Shreyak, are you going to start or? Uh, I, I think I'm going to talk uh, at the end. So okay. we'll go across to Naveen first and then uh, okay. Purna Chandra. Okay, certainly. Let me start my presentation. One minute, guys. Right. Sorry, I'm just trying my screen share. Give me a minute. So I hope my screen is visible to all of you. Yeah, it's pretty clear. Thank you. Uh, sorry, one minute. I'll just uh, have to go back to the this, guys. One minute. Huh. So hello, everyone. I am Dr. Naveen Kumar from Bangalore. 
So this is uh, a small presentation regarding our experience with regard to the uh, uh, with regard to AutoCAD so far. I call it a preferred technique because so far uh, we have been having very encouraging results, albeit it's a short experience so far. So uh, just to set the agenda there, I'm going to present a couple of cases over here and just the outcomes what we have had so far and the comparison with uh, other procedures which we normally tend to do. So in terms of the patients, let me start with one patient who, uh, whom I saw almost 15 months ago. We had a 15 months follow up for this uh, guy, 35 year old with ACL, uh, ACL tear, plus he has had a medial tibial condyle cartilage loss. Uh, this gentleman was an ex-football player who has had this injury almost two years prior to me seeing him. Uh, so he was keen to return back to pre-injury level of fitness. So we discussed about the options with him. Uh, of course, we are going to go ahead with the ACL reconstruction. Then alongside with that, whether to go with stem cell or autocot. So we decided to go with the autocot. And uh, so here is a uh, picture from interoperative uh, uh, interoperative things. As you can see, uh, there is a large area of cartilage loss on the medial condyle, the medial tibial condyle, which we filled up with the autocard. So he had a very good result uh, one year, 15 months down the line. We'll talk about that in a minute. So the second patient who was a 39 year old who has had knee pain in the anterior knee, uh, patellofemoral, plus she had the medial compartment pain as well. She she was having pain whenever she was squatting or whenever she was sitting cross-legged and even on climbing the stairs, she used to have problems. So MRI scan revealed grade 4 changes in the patellar lateral facet and also grade 3 changes in the medial femoral condyle. Uh, her expectations were just to get back to pain-free mobility and being able to sit squatting and sitting, sitting cross-legged. So we discussed between options between microfracture and autocard for this lady. So this is one lady where I tried to mix the principles, what Professor Salzman was uh, uh, talking about earlier on, where for the patella, patella I did the chondroplasty. For the medial femoral condyle, we, uh, I did a uh, microfracture, post which I did the autocart. So in that lady, we had a bit of an issues because we did try to mix the principles because one, there was more bleeding there, uh, and getting a dry field to do the autocot was difficult. That was one issue. And secondly, uh, her medial condyle pain has sort of persisted. So I also did the patellar things for her patellar chondroplasty. This was this was supposed to be this was this had to be done open because uh, patella. I find it very difficult to do it through arthroscopy to stick the things and stay it there. So uh, post that one, you can see it worked beautifully well for her. And let me run this. This is the part. So within three minutes of uh, putting the fibrin coverage there, we can see that it's already quite stable. Right. So there's another patient whom I uh, operated about six months ago. So this gentleman was having a uh, having multiple locking episodes of the knee with a loose body. So he was having painful locking. MRS can reveal an osteochondral defect. However, the, there is not a big loss of bone part there. Uh, it was mainly a predominantly cartilage loss, which was there. Uh, this was not a typical case of uh, osteochondritis desiccans, but this was due to trauma at a later date. So uh, the expectations for him was to get, get pain-free mobility and back to his work. Uh, so for this gentleman, we dis discussed between three options, stem cell, Autocot as well as oats. Uh, oats I didn't go with because it was not a typical osteochondritis desiccans. Even now, for patients with osteochondritis desiccans, I do go down the route of doing oats for them. Uh, in his case, we did go ahead with the autocot. Here you can see the area of deficiency where he has had cartilage loss, uh, where this is the uh, autocot part which we have done for him. So the post-op care, what I, we have been following here in our setup is uh, I do keep the knee in extension for a week uh, and I, I will allow them to partial weight bear for up to one month. I start the knee range of motion exercises without loading after a week. Uh, I do start them 
on static course exercises early uh, there is no standardized way of doing this so this is what we have been following and that seems to be working well for us so here are some examples of the procedures which we have done so this you can see this was the one year pre and post uh, artocot chondroplasty the femoral condyle we can see that that has beautifully healed well in the second image there this is the lateral view of the same picture uh, as you can see the marrow edema is better now and also there is a new cartilage which we can see uh, i agreed with the uh, previous speakers which uh, whom we discussed with earlier on about standardization of the mri scans can be difficult however the results when correlated with the rest of the clinical uh, scenarios it looks the things seem to be working quite well so and here is another case with the patellar chondroplasty which we did for without using autocot technology we can see that the bone marrow edema is gotten better and we have got a uh, new cartilage which has formed over there so here is our experience sum summarized so far so i have done so seven cases so far uh, out of them most of them have got good results as we can see uh, the one lady with failure what i was talking about was the one where we did the micro fracture plus followed by autocot so her patellofemoral patellofemoral problems did get resolved however the medial condyle pain still remains for this lady so that is one thing which we learned by experience that mixing two techniques of doing micro fracture and autocot wouldn't be a great idea so in our experience so far to discuss between the two uh, different things which we do autocot and oats both can be effective if used for the right kind of uh, uh, indications uh, but oats the availability is limited and we can't extend it for larger areas whereas with autocot we can have that bit of play for bigger areas and as uh, mr dr salsman told us earlier on we can spread it out to a bigger area as well uh, as we don't really need to fill it to the brim or, or further so in terms of cartilage thickness that will be more uniform with autocot we can achieve that one donor site morbidity will be less with autocot compared to oats so with regard to the uh, difference between autologous stem cell and autocot the first thing which i would mainly look at is expense because stem cell so far in india at least we have found it to be much more expensive compared to what autocot can be uh, secondly if you are doing it by sending it to the lab and regeneration that is a lag period and two procedures that can be avoided with autocot cartilage thickness which we have achieved from with autocot so far with our mri uh, evaluation has been good uh, availability wise autocot is easily available stem cell may not be available in every place uh, remote places particularly so if we compare between micro fracture and autocot uh, like it was discussed earlier on the responses with micro fracture can be quite inconsistent which we have experienced quite often so uh, that is one big difference and cartilage thickness and quality which we achieve with micro fracture can be much more poorer so so far what we have found out is in terms of benefits uh, better outcomes in comparison to micro fracture can cover larger areas autocot is a single step all autologous which is cartilage mins prp or acp plus thrombin economically more viable Uh, and no regulatory issues which we end up having with allocards allocard grafts and no donor site morbidity so limitations so far uh, we don't know what the long term outcomes are going to be uh, because we don't have a long follow up so far how is it going to work for different locations say for example if we, if you're doing it for patella will it take a better compared to tibia or femur that's a, that's one thing which we are not sure of as of yet osteochondral osteochondral lesions especially if there is osteochondral desiccans if the bone quality is poor will it work or not is a question uh, whether open versus orthoscopic which one works better because with orthoscopic we will have to dry the field which can be a challenge sometimes uh, there are lack of comparative studies between these things these different techniques so far so that's the limitation uh, one paper which can give you a lot of insight about this is uh, mr Sa dr salsman's paper which uh, gives the biological part of the how the mince cartilage autocot works for for the joint so thank you thank you navin uh, thank you for taking the time thank you good presentation uh, cases uh, one or two questions which are coming up mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. 
ലൈക്ക് നൗ uh so we had three scans done so far out of seven but it's a bit difficult to get the scans done people will not always be upfront to get the post surgery scan particularly if they're doing well would you actually ask for cartilage sequencing by doing an mri scan or routine mri does work for you uh no i do ask for uh, the cartilage mapping as well so but yeah uh, like we discussed at the limitations in the prayer meeting between a uh, uh between us so uh, patients do go to different centers sometimes and get them done so that standardization is one thing which we struggle with perfect and do you use fibrin or you combine when you okay. how do you uh, actually do it? yeah for the first one or two cases i used the thrombin but now i have been using the fibrin glue yeah okay perfect thank you thank you many thank you amazing collection some more questions coming up but i think we will keep on asking as the things move up sure uh, so just me i think you are the next in line uh, it will be interesting for us to hear from you as well your experiences uh, uh sure I, uh, uh thank you dr ips obray sir uh, let me share my screen uh i hope all of you can uh, uh, share my screen i am uh, i am dr tejaswi i am working at hyderabad uh yeah please so i i'll skip this part uh, uh my my job is to present uh, two of my cases uh before before this i would like to say that my experience with uh, autocart has been uh, uh, naive to to say the best because i have done uh, three cases till now uh, three cases in the knee and one case in the ankle i am uh, uh, i am pretty much uh, more into microfracture stimulation and uh, uh, oats procedures for my cartilage defects uh, aci is not uh, picked up in india uh, as of as yet as dr professor uh, rightly said uh, so my first patient is a 28 year old uh, female uh, she is an it professional by occupation uh, she had a injury while skipping at home uh, around 6 months back she came to me with a dull aching pain in her knee joint with occasional clicking uh, there were actually pa- patient and her relatives were actually quite worried in fact the patient did postpone her marriage because of this reason uh, they had consulted many physicians before me she had taken multiple course of nsads there was no benefit from this uh, also she did undergo a structured rehab at a sports uh, center uh, on on my exam she except for slight anteromedial joint tenderness everything else was fairly normal uh, radiograph was fairly normal with good alignment uh these are the mr mr images she did in fact come to me with already uh, uh done mri otherwise i would prefer to do a cartilage mapping for all my patients especially younger ones with uh, dull aching pain and with no uh, symptoms of uh, ligamentous laxity uh, you can see fair signal uh, uh, on the uh, image on the left side uh, in t2 sequences in both uh, uh, coronal and uh, sagittal sequences i did suspect some kind of a cartilage lesion but i was not sure whether it would be a full thickness defect uh, other than that uh, uh, there was nothing i could uh, really make out Uh, so the patient was counseled we did we decided to go ahead with diagnostic arthroscopy and take it from there i did keep an option of uh, 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 oats and micro uh, and uh, uh, marrow stimulation for if the patient had a uh, 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 pro- defect in the cartilage Uh, this is the video uh, this is a 1 minute video of the arthroscope when i put my uh, scope inside the medial femoral condyle there was a partial grade 2 or grade 3 uh, thickness defect on the medial femoral condyle i i 
this was not a full thickness defect. So I, I went ahead and debrided the cartilage. Um, however, the patient had good surrounding cartilage all around with good shoulder. Uh, so this was a de de defect at the end of debridement. Uh, and uh, because of the size of the defect and young female initially, uh, let me stop this video here. Um, I, in fact, I decided initially for an oats procedure, but this patient's knee was so small that I couldn't even take out a 10 millimeter. Uh, the patient's defects turned out to be 10 by 10 uh, millimeter. I couldn't uh, take out a 10 millimeter plug of the oats. So then I, I, I changed my idea to uh, uh, the, the autocart procedure. Then. I went ahead and harvested the chips uh, from the uh, intercondylar notch as already I had debrided the lesion. Uh, so here I used a four millimeter Excalibur shaver. Uh, then I went ahead and uh, uh, dried the lesion up. This uh, is the size of the lesion. It was pretty small, but you can see the size of the condyle. Even a one by one centimeter uh, lesion was almost involving the entire medial femoral condyle. In this patient, this was my first patient I was doing the autocad, so I decided to go ahead and add a microfracture technique, uh, but I'm not doing, uh, after this, I have not done for the, any other cases. Uh, this is the, and after that, uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, application curate uh, of the uh, uh, minced cartilage along with, uh, uh, along with the, uh, PRP solution, uh, and this is the thrombin along with PRP that is used to uh, coagulate or stabilize the lesion. I had, uh, 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 and again, I think this are our first cases that we're doing. That's why we uh, we tend to overfill this, and only time will tell, as Professor Sal Salzman said, uh, whether we should do this a little uh, less than the a uh, uh, little lesser than the surrounding cartilage defect. Uh, so discussion part, I'll, I'll not go through this entire uh, uh, table, but we know that for smaller lesions, uh, the options that we have are really between marrow stimulating technique, that is microfracture and an osteochondral autograft. Uh, we normally uh, do not have the option of uh, ACI, at least in my part of the uh, my part of the country. Uh, for larger lesions, of course, uh, uh, we have or uh, oats procedure using an allograft technique, but mainly we have to choose between a micro marrow stimulation technique that is a microfracture and an oats procedure. Uh, so in this patients, as I said, the options available were a marrow stimulation technique or an oats, but I did not go for a marrow stimulation because we all know that the results are inconsistent and uh, uh, but patients, most uh, a, sub, a certain subset of patients are not happy with the follow-up results. Uh, however, as I said, initially I was planned for an oats, but because of the small knee, I had to change my uh, plan to a, a, a marrow stimulation technique, and I decided to add an autocad for that. This, my first patient is seven months post-op, and she's uh, quite happy with the results. She is symptomatically better, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, she is uh, uh, progressing with her life very well uh, during the last follow-up. So my second patient, uh, this is a 49-year-old male. Uh, I have two contrasting patients. One is a younger female who was a traumatic injury, which progressed to a grade three chondral defect. And this is a 49-year-old female. There is no obvious history of trauma, chronic knee pain since most of uh, since uh, more than a year. Clinical examination was fairly okay, except again for a medial uh, joint length tenderness, Matt Morris was positive for medial meniscus, uh, came with, to me with an MRI scan. X-ray was fairly okay. I could see a grade one uh, changes for osteoarthritis. However, uh, when I see the MRI, there is a posterior horn medial meniscus tear, which kind of looked more of a degenerative kind. And there were some signals uh, in the medial femoral condyle subchondral bone. However, there is no obvious uh, osteoarthritic changes here. Uh, there are some uh, peaking osteophytes on the uh, coronal sequences. Other than that, the MRI looked fairly okay. So uh, what I was looking was at a uh, meniscus tear and a uh, suspected chondral lesion. Um, most probably, I was thinking it to be a degenerative. So this is first surgical video. This is a diagnostic video. Uh, after which I wanted to discuss what are the options. This was this was the lesion on the medial femoral condyle. You can see some grade one or grade two changes of the medial femoral condyle and uh, the tibia. There are some uh, degenerative changes of the meniscus. However, the lateral compartment was pristine with normal meniscus and good cartilage tissue. Uh, so I, uh, this, is the, this is the lesion with the uh, cartilage flaps. Uh, I went ahead and debrided the lesion with, uh, debrided the lesion to get uh, uh, 
let me just uh, forward this video a bit this was the end lesion my 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 probe is around 4 millimeter 4 millimeter long the air, and so it was around 8 millimeter uh 8 millimeter by 4 millimeter which is around between 1 to 1.5 centimeter square um at the at the end of this, I just want to discuss on the decision on mode of cartilage repair for this uh, uh, particular patient. Uh, what are the factors that we take into consideration? And um, uh, at this stage, I would like, I like to ask the faculty as well what they would think on the right uh, mode of cartilage repair for this patient. For me, uh, the most important factors would be age and etiology. Uh, here we know that um, uh, for a marrow uh, for a marrow stimulation technique, the chondrogenic potency of the stem cells decreases with age and they are clearly inferior and many studies have pointed to the same. The size of the defect also here it is an oblong defect. Uh, uh, if I have to prefer for an OATS procedure, um, we are, uh, the surrounding cartilage is not as good because it's already a degenerative knee. The cartilage thickness would vary. So uh, I am uh, very skeptic skeptical about oats in this procedure. Um, can I, um, uh, Doctor Sir, can I stop at this moment for a minute to see what other faculty think about what would be the right procedure for yeah. this kind of patient? Yeah. So, Professor Salzman, what's your take? I mean, patient is a, a bit more elderly now. Uh, do we have a potential of these chondrocytes as well to proliferate into a good cartilage in some cases? Just Sorry. update on you. Um. Sorry, can you can you get can you get your question again? I didn't get it. Sorry, the quality. The question essentially was: uh, as the patient grows older, uh, have you in your study as well found that if okay. the patient is forty-five, fifty, or even uh, elderly than that, yeah. is the chondrogenic density of cartilage cells becoming less as it grows older? Usually, I don't see a difference. Uh, according to evidence, there's absolutely no difference in cartilage uh, quality at uh, between 20 and 50. But the whole patient is getting older, the knee is getting older. So this uh, requires a little more time with regard to rehabilitation. But if you're accepting that, uh, the outcome should be pretty similar when treating 25-year-old or 50-year-old. So my age limit now is actually 60. I tell my patients it requires longer time than in a 20-year-old, but um, the long-term result may be equally well. And uh, second uh, question here is, uh, in such older patients, often they have what we call as kissing lesion. So we do have a femoral lesion, but would also have some amount of tibial damage as well. So would you still yeah. have on the tibial side as well? So, so the kiss, kiss lesions are always problematic. Usually in standard cartilage repair, it's a contraindication, but uh, you always have the problem of young patients who are pre-arthritic and having kissing lesions, and sometimes they are below the age of 30. So uh, there's absolutely no option for arthroplasty. So I tell my patients, we can give it a try with a high risk. And then uh, I also have done now six uh, large kissing lesion cases where I usually use a membrane on the larger side and a standard autocard on the smaller side. So far, also doing pretty nice, uh, but um, more uh, chances of um, scar tissue, more chances of transplant hypertrophy and so on. So I have uh, debrided two out of those five already, but the cartilage looked fine on MRI and on arthroscopy. So it's not a no-go, but you have to be very careful, very strict indication and very good education of the patient. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Sarkar. I think, uh, Dr. Justy, that answers your question. So we can proceed. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, so, but keeping in mind the age of the patient, uh, the uh, the other options are not very good for this uh, for this uh, respective patient. I went on to do uh, autocard for this procedure. This is the video for the same. Uh, uh, initially, we uh, we were trying to take uh, cartilage uh, pieces from the intercondylar notch. This is me taking. This is me using a 4.5 millimeter uh, burr, 4.5 millimeter shaver sorry, four millimeter shaver from the intercolonial notch, uh, getting the cartilage pieces into the uh, 
collector and once i did that uh, once i did that uh, it so i'm taking the pieces from all around the intercolon notch without disturbing the weight bearing area uh, once i did that i proceed to dry the knee uh, uh, to get a, a fair view of the lesion you can see that the surrounding cartilage is not very good as you can expect in a 49 year old uh, gentleman but uh, it was fairly okay uh, considering that there was no full thickness defect of the other lesions uh, once i was satisfied with the uh, pre uh, preparation of the lesion uh, i i uh, this is the applicator for the uh, uh, commenced cartilage pieces uh, in fact it is most mo most of the times around for 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 the lesion size of 1 to 2 cm uh, uh, i i what i felt was around 1 cm square uh, area of uh, um, men's cartilage pieces was more than sufficient and once i did that i used my uh, neuropathies to uh, to give a nice uh, contour around the lesion and this is me applying the uh, thrombin uh, you can see that already the there is a nice clot being formed and after this uh, uh, i i took the knee through a range of motion and found that the knee was uh, uh, in fact the lesion was uh, uh, quite stable this patient is uh, this is the end result this patient is now uh, four month post op and quite happy uh, he has just started full weight bearing uh, so one one month back uh, uh, as of now he is uh, doing quite good so in conclusion for me for any cartilage defect uh, the symptom, the goal is to fill a cartilage defect with durable repair tissue so that uh, the main aim for me is to relieve patients of the pain and give a good functional recovery uh, i would say the new kid on the block that is autocart or the aacr is a novel technique especially for smaller lesions uh, early oa with focal defects and good shoulder cartilage also i would like to add one more point here it is also good for especially young uh, small female knees where it is difficult to take a plug from uh, uh, from the knee especially in the uh, oats procedure however uh, a longer follow up required with comparative studies to uh, uh, further uh, uh, strengthen this point thank you uh, for thank you everyone for the opportunity thank you dr tejasvi uh, good and interesting cases both the spectrum of a young patient as well as old patient uh, but what we have learned from professor salzman lecture as well in the Probably local area cartilage is the best cartilage rather than harvesting the cartilage cells from the intercolor nerve. And I think probably and as he said, and you are able to get good uh, amount of cartilage from locally. Well. So you don't need to actually boil it down. Uh, so yeah, I agree. What you add on? This is done. Salzman, would you agree to that that uh, local cartilage is good enough and you don't need intercolor uh, notch area to be divided? Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, I would suggest to take only local cartilage because it is weight bearing, location specific cartilage, and usually you have more than enough, as you just seen in the video. You usually have more than enough uh, to transplant. And um, just wanted to comment on one thing. Uh, you you. Um, said in your talk that it is uh, suggested for only small diameter lesions. Uh, I've done many uh, larger diameter lesions, even going up to 10 square centimeters. And I think with regard to biologic potential, this is even a perfect fit. So I think it is a perfect fit for um, for small lesions to to avoid microfracturing, but also for covering up larger lesions because of the biologic potential. And I, I've seen specifically in the larger lesions absolutely no delamination. So uh, six, eight uh, square centimeters, no problem. Selected cases, 10 square centimeters. And I'm following up all my subjects with MRI and uh, also there, no, no problem. So to, to my consideration, absolutely concurring to, to ACI. If you have absolutely no bone <coughs> stock, no border around and so on, I think that's too much. That's better for um, osteochondral allografts. But other than that, um, it's also very good for larger lesions. Selman, uh, just one question. When you do an arthroscopy, maybe for an ACL or a meniscal surgery, and then you find that there is a cartilage blister, the cartilage is just soft, Exactly not broken. 
like you can prove it. It's something like a blister, and you know that if you just remove that, you are actually uh, seeing a different thing. So, how aggressive are you uh, debriding these blisters as well as and then doing transplanting? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's that's not an easy question. You know, um, uh, that's highly individual. So, if if I if I if I uh, use my probing hook. And I've I've seen the surface already has cracks, and there's to my consideration absolutely no chance this is going to regenerate. I break it up, but I'm very conservative in those ones because I see some regeneration potential of the ACL and what is hop ha happening around the ACL and stuff. So in most cases this works, but. If, if the patient is coming back for the one-year visit with a very stable knee joint but still pain with regard to the cartilage lesion, you have done uh, a, a mistake um, retrospectively. So it is highly individual. Um, sometimes this way, sometimes that way. Yeah, I know. That's always a dilemma when you treat patients with a body are borderline. Say, us, I think, let me come to your presentation. The last one on the line. Yeah. Sure. I'm just bringing it up. Yes, we might need to wrap it up in the next 10 to 15 minutes. So. Can you see my screen? No, no, not your screen. Okay, because it says shared here. Click the window. Yeah, one second. Um. It pinched I think there's one more question. I mean, okay, sir. Yeah, we lost, but it's still not. Sir. Open the shell tray and open the window. Share the window. Okay. Yeah, can you see it now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Good. Yes, yes. Now we are able to see that. You can run. Okay. Yeah. Go, uh, Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, IPS Obera and Arthrex and Avana, for the invitation. Uh, just to share my experience uh, over the last two and a half years since I've started using AutoCart, it's very important that uh, before venturing into any cartilage procedure, we ensure that we deal uh, with the key principles, which is uh, dealing with the alignment first, followed by stability, addressing any meniscal uh, imbalance and thereafter we venture into cartilage regeneration procedure to ensure the success of the technique. So my first case is a 47 year old uh, lady who presents with a five to six months uh, history of knee pain. This was predominantly mechanical. There was associated uh, swelling and she had failed an initial uh, line of non-operative management. And on examination, she had normal symmetrical alignment there was mild diffusion in the knee with uh, medial joint line tenderness and full range of motion. So these are her uh, radiographs. And uh, obviously in this situation, we needed a, she came in with a MRI, which uh, as you can see, uh, shows a cartilage lesion in the weight bearing area of the medial femoral condyle. There is an associated effusion. And in addition, she also has uh, mucoid degeneration uh, in her ACL ligament. So we're, we're dealing with uh, a young patient with a, with a failing knee. And uh, 
because of her non failure to non operative line of management and her symptoms we offered her uh, an arthroscopic procedure and at the time of the procedure the medial femoral condyle weight bearing lesion was identified grade 4 lesion as you can see and uh, uh, quite a large type of lesion in the weight bearing area so generally in our country when we look at the various options available for cartilage procedures we are either looking at bone marrow stimulation an oats type of procedure an aci which we know is two stage uh, a bmag type of procedure and of course the uh, autocart uh, which we are talking about today so uh, generally i for this larger lesions i don't think there would be any debate that we'd be looking at option c d uh, and in the present day e uh, i open i did not prefer the aci over the years being a two stage procedure and also uh, there were some regulatory concerns in the last few years so bmac was my go to option but obviously uh, you know iliac crest harvesting uh, was a concern so the introduction of the autocart procedure is quite attractive and i've been really uh, happy uh, with its usage uh, and its indications so what we did in her case uh, was an autocard procedure the principles are important to ensure that the lesion uh, stable edges uh, are identified and prepared all these loose cartilage ends from the weight bearing area are subsequently sucked in into a low profile non aggressive shaver blade i think this is very important to ensure that we don't uh, damage the uh, harvested cartilage so this is the smooth lesion then a dry arthroscopy is performed i use the carbon dioxide insufflator Uh, drying the area is very important, and there with a dedicated uh, delivery cannula, these autocart uh, the cartilage chips mixed with PRP are uh, delivered into the uh, knee joint, and subsequently one needs to ensure that uh, they are smoothened and uniformly distributed along the lesion. Again, as uh, Rian alluded, it's very important not to. overdo it to prevent any hypertrophy which is uh, again something of main concern so at the end of the placement of these chips the thrombinator is introduced again you know we are used to using the fibrin glue but the thermal effect is not good for these chondrocytes so really the thrombinator is the recommended uh, you know the go to option and at the end whatever is the platelet poor prp that is uh, subsequently injected into the knee joint so after Uh, uh at the end it's ensured that the the range of motion is performed to make sure that the construct is stable so this is the same lady at a years follow up uh, her symptoms uh, were completely resolved there was no it was a quiet knee with no effusion and the joint line tenderness had also uh, resolved and you can see her mri here uh, there is evidence of uh, uh, in cartilage regeneration on her mr imaging again what is important is that this will mature over time so this is just a years follow up and uh, uh, from a patient point of view she is very happy with the procedure having understood that this has been a large defect over the weight bearing area and the main reason for her complaints the second patient again uh, is uh, somebody in his 40s uh, he was uh, somebody who was in the army and had to do a lot of uh, activities including uphill and downhill and he had uh, many years of knee pain and swelling which failed conservative line of management again importantly the knee alignment was normal and symmetrical he had moderate swelling on presentation and uh, his knee range of motion was uh, near normal so these are his weight bearing radiographs as you can uh, appreciate there have been some uh, cartilage changes due to his level of activity and chronicity but importantly his alignments uh, in both knees were, were uh, symmetrical and within the normal acceptable uh, limit so these are his mri images he had predominantly a lateral compartment involvement uh, both it was a bipolar lesion involving both the femur and the tibia and you can see here and uh, just earlier we had this discussion at uh, these lesions can be quite challenging to treat this patient did not want an arthroplasty option which uh, you know can uh, be offered and um, obviously we are looking to try and delay a replacement type of procedure as much as we can so this was his lesion on arthroscopy quite an extensive uh, bipolar lesion uh, 
involving both the medial and the uh, tibial side. So again, we've gone through these options and uh, there wouldn't be any debate that ACI, BMAC or the autocard procedure would be helpful. Oats would really not, uh, because it uh, involves a lot of harvesting and also trying to replicate the contour of the femoral condyle is challenging. Bone marrow stimulation really would fail very quickly in these larger lesions. So what we did is again an autocarve type of uh, technique. Unlike the first patient, what is important to remember is that when we have a larger lesion, we really need to have uh, a good harvest of chondrocytes to cover the area. Uh, we do not be too aggressive and get excessive chondrocytes, but certainly good enough to cover that uh, lesion is, remains very crucial. So he presented, obviously because of the COVID situation, uh, his follow-up uh, in the early stages was delayed, but we recalled him uh, it, earlier this year, a two-year follow-up, he remains asymptomatic, the joint space is maintained with no narrowing, he's able to return back to his activities, and you can see the, uh, the MRIs at two-year follow-up. Uh, there is some amount of uh, bone marrow edema uh, noted here, and as uh, Ria mentioned earlier, uh, these type of lesions can be quite challenging, but at the same time, seeing this type of result uh, uh, and him being asymptomatic and able to return to his uh, active duties is really gratifying. And certainly we can delay an arthroplasty type of uh, a procedure, which would be inevitable with bipolar and extensive type of disease. I would just like to share one more case uh, involving the ankle in a 39-year-old runner, one-year presentation of symptoms, again, failed non-operative treatment, normal alignment, uh, painful joint line and also range of motion restricted terminally. So these were her radiographs. You can see the osteochondral lesion in the medial femoral condyle in the weight bearing area with uh, associated cyst, as you can see here. And what we uh, ended up seeing is that they, when we do a diagnostic arthroscopy, they do appear very uh, small uh, and benign, but when you really do a thorough debridement, it is quite an extensive area. Fortunately, there was no uh, subchondral defect, so we just ended up doing an autocar type of procedure. Again, we've been through these options, and uh, here, uh, because the Taylor cartilage harvest is not enough, taking to extend the size of the lesion, I went into the knee and harvested the uh, cartilage from the intercondylar area, and she was preoperatively consented for the same, and that's the postoperative picture. This lady lives in Shanghai, so unfortunately, uh, despite me recalling her, we've not had a comeback for an MRI, so I, I am not able to share those images, but she remains uh, asymptomatic uh, till her early follow-up, at least at six months. So really, the autocard procedure is very much attractive for me, especially for more than two centimeter square lesions, because it is really one step. You know, intraoperatively, if we identify a lesion, we can take a decision. The equipment is readily available to do the procedure. Uh, micro drilling, as we know, it does not give good results in these larger regions. So replacement by chondrocytes and cartilage matrix without cell culture and harvesting normal cartilage really is the advantage of this procedure. Uh, also, we can do it arthroscopically in the same stage. The only concern is the quantity, but again, Jia from his experience over the years has eluded that one need not be overly aggressive and try and harvest excessive cartilage because that may lead to hypertrophy in the long run. And uh, as mentioned in his talk, we have had a uh, good uh, early to now midterm follow-up, so the results are really encouraging. So just my pulse, having done this procedure over two and a half years, is that please use a low-profile shaver like a 3, or if you're using a 4mm, use a non-aggressive blade like a, a torpedo, uh, which is very important. Adequate harvesting of the cartilage chips is important, but don't be uh, over-excessive. And importantly, in the early years, uh, micro drilling was advocated, but certainly the quality of the regenerate is poor and affected, and the subchondral bone becomes hard. So, no prior micro drilling uh, doing the autocard procedure. Uh, if there is a subchondral defect, bone grafting is important. Uh, also, do a dry arthroscopy, and if uh, debatable, don't hesitate to do it through an open procedure. And preferably use a thrombinator rather than a fibrin glue because you don't want these chondrocytes to be subjected to the thermal effect of the fibrin. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Shriyash. Uh, good, uh, very interesting cases. I see the ankle case as well. So, 
come where we can use people. There's two questions which have come up in my mind. Uh, yes. How do you evaluate the subcontrol mode? The question is necrotic subcontrol. Often ankle has got necrotic subcontrol. Mode. How would you actually address that? So you, uh, one gets an idea from the pre-operative MR as to whether there is a subchondral cyst or not. But obviously, intraoperatively, we would probe. But if the if the subchondral bone is of good quality, I would not uh, be over enthusiastic and try and you know uh, uh, curate it to create a larger defect. But if in if in doubt, the, you know we have the synthetic bone graft uh, in OR, so we can really bone graft it and put the autograft on top of it. Professor uh, Salzman, again. Uh, from where do you take the cancerous bone for the cancerous bone plastic? Right, for the, adding on a cancerous bone plastic with the. Uh, uh, um. Sorry, I have some some uh, uh, quality problems, but uh, with regard to the subchondral bone, so far. Um, I just combine it as a one-step procedure. I perform an autologous or sometimes allogenic cancellous bone plasty. And since I have ACP on my table, anyhow, I mix it up with my ACP and then I really press it down. And the ACP, as you know, if you leave it on the table too long, it's clotting already. So the clotting effect is also happening with the bone and it is actually uh, more intense. So you have a very good base and um, I, I think it's not not a problem to put the autocar chips on top. Uh, just one comment on your very great talk, which is, which is really great, and I, I see you have a lot of experience now. I think what is also now very important, what I've seen so far, I also still do the, the mistake, I think, is the size of the chips. So the smaller, the better, because more easy to transplant, better cover, coverage up of the defect. Uh, um, easier for the chips for the cells to outgrow uh, from the chips. It still it still works with larger chips, but I think the also the regeneration is faster with the smaller chips because they get digested faster. But that that is still hypothetic. But I think that's the topic. Yeah, on those lines, can I just quickly ask you the so obviously the the low profile small joint shaver blade is recommended. I tried using it, but sometimes it does not cover the distance to the defect, and therefore I tend to use the torpedo, the 4 mm ah. non-aggressive. What are your okay. views on it? So, um, usually now now I do it that way. Um, I do bright the joint using 4.0, very aggressive, so it's quick. S then I take a sharp spoon and go around the edge, but uh, just just uh, click click click, and then I go in with a 3.8 soft tissue from Arthrex, which is available, I I suck up those pieces and the, the chip size with a 3.8 is okay. It's actually better than 4.0, even if there's only a small difference. And finally, I come in with a 3.0 uh, soft tissue shaver device, which is uh, in my hands long enough um, to, to reach everything. And then I take rounds at the, at the defect. And then I tell my nurse, please give me the 3.0 chips first. And then I transplant the 3.0 first, and usually that is enough. And I have as a backup the 3.8 chips. <laughs> so this is how I currently do do it. But usually the 3.0 is long enough to reach everything. Maybe right. not in the. And Jia, in doing your range of motion after you uh, you put the thrombinator, so two minutes is good enough, or do you wait longer for larger no. lesions? No, so um, when I put my fibrin on top of the uh, as the final seal, usually it is clotting while you are applicating. So the the process is so quick, you two minutes. Yeah, great. Dr. Salzman, can I ask you one question there? Uh, with regard to you mentioned about how fast fat pad, you get some of that added to the mixture. So how do you collect that? Because that doesn't get collected in the thrombinator, of course, isn't it? Because it gets passed by. No, I collect it in the trombinate and uh, the graft net. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is easy to collect in graft net, no problem. So does I the collect it. Hold it. Actually, does the graft net hold that as well? Actually, if we shave yeah. it, yeah. because I have been deliberately avoiding that actually to shave off yeah. the at that right. time when making the uh, yeah. graft. Since I'm very aggressive on the hoffa or mildly mm -hmm. aggressive, I I just want to have space, um, and I found out that I I often. Uh, put some in the graft net and um, the results on MRI look fantastic. 
but that's also partially hypothetic if that's uh, that's perfect but so far i don't have a problem with it but not so much just just mildly okay but you can also you can also collect bone using the graph net. You can collect anything. So I started to to augment my ACL surgery with bone, which I which I collect in the graph net. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, so in uh, 2021, once you have been doing uh, auto part for long, is there a role of ACI still in your practice, or you have actually just stopped doing any? Age? Also, a very good question. Um, uh, ACI, more or less, I have stopped doing that. The, the problem is uh, many of my patients are well educated. Uh, they uh, they look in the internet um, before and so on, and um, they um, they don't go so much to the biology. They go mostly for uh, it's only one operation. Um, and if they tell, if I tell my patients the the results I've seen so far are equally well when comparing ACI to AutoCAD, they get just clo uh, clearly go for for AutoCAD. And I've I've seen I see I've I have a lot of trauma and and spontaneous cases. And for those cases, it's just perfect when you have flakes and so on. You just can transplant them direct uh, uh, a, as a one step procedure. But also, um, many insurance companies just just don't pay for it anymore for ACI. Um, many hospitals have stopped it. They tell, told their doctors, "You are not allowed to do ACI anymore." And this is, is this is Germany, so usually you get paid for everything. <laughs> Perfect. I think. Uh, thank you very much, Professor I must thank all. I think it was an excellent uh, impact. Results have actually increased the confidence uh, of us. Who had had to do more of these cases, but we have learned today that with a larger defect as well, conditions as well. What we learned today is that that local cartilage is the best one, rather than going from intercondylar or not. Local cartilage is good and it is adequate as well. Uh, <laughs> you told us about not to mix the pieces of uh, doing a micro fracture with add on or and uh, what you also discussed is that PRP is good enough and you don't need to actually go for a VMAT because it might proliferate it to bone and maybe painful. So I think overall, all this uh, interaction has helped us in extending the indication and learning the indication about the cartilage regeneration and more confidently now we can go ahead and probably start <coughs> first. Thank you for joining in and I would give the uh, handover to Tom. Yes, thank you very much, guys. Uh, just a quick one from me to finish off. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending, especially to our uh, brilliant faculty, as always. I'm sure everyone will agree that it was a great insight to, to the next generation in uh, cartilage regeneration. So, again, thank you very much, and thank you to Rachir and Ivana, as always, uh, brilliant partners. Um, yeah, thank you very much, guys. I hope everyone stays safe and I hope you all have a, a brilliant week ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks, Gian. Thanks, guys. Nice thank to meet you. you. Much. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, IPS. See you. Bye. Thank you.